Tonight, we continued our discussion on being the best mother possible for your child. Lots of basic concepts, lots of very practical application tips and tricks. I hope you will gain. I hope you will find you can put one thing in your pocket or three things in your pocket or five things in your pocket to help you be the best mother possible. Please share with another mother so she should become the best mother possible. And please subscribe. So last week, we did start with this with this theme of being the best mother, which actually was was coming from Natalie, this idea. And I gave two ideas last week. One idea that we discussed is you are the correct mother and this is the correct child, meaning you are the correct mother. You have what this child needs. Even if you think you don't, you do. Even if they think you don't, you do. And this is a correct child for you. This is a child that's also going to help you on your growth, where you have to move. That was the first idea we discussed with a lot of details. And the second idea was trusting God, that just as we trust God for everything else in our life, we also have to trust God that this child will be okay. This child is going to be fine. I need to do my work. And we do. I'm not, you know, reneging responsibility but I am not going to be a worried, stressed, what's going to be, what's going to be in a year, what's going to be in five years, what's going to be in 10 years. Will he ever get toilet trained? Will he ever get married? No, this child will be fine. I'm trusting God. So those are the two ideas we discussed last week. And we have now had a week in, since that class. So anyone try to utilize those principles or did utilize them over the week? Well, it certainly was a thought that I had in the back of my head. Um, we had our challenges this week, but it was also taking the time to play with them, which when you're moving is hard to do. Absolutely. It is hard. And it's hard also when you're not moving. There's so many things on the list that we have to do that it's sometimes hard just to relax and play and enjoy them and let them enjoy you. It's hard. It's hard to do. Stop, breathe, you know, enjoy the flowers. It's hard. Our pace is too fast. So that's, that's definitely good. At least in the back of your mind to know these ideas. Hopefully just calms you, reassures you, makes you less nervous, makes you more confident, and all those things help. Anyone else? Anyone else use these ideas over the week? I think I used the, that idea some with, um, you know, what's my business, what's his business, you know, and not getting involved in his play and just trusting that, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to do the right things and model the right behavior. And, um, you know, he's a child, he's going to make mistakes, and that's how he'll learn sometimes. Absolutely. He's not you. He's not your mirror. He's going to make different mistakes. He's going to make his own unique mistakes. And yes, yeah, sometimes it really is hard just to let go and let them make their mistakes. But absolutely, that's part of the trust is they'll make mistakes and they'll grow from them. And as we make mistakes, and as we've hopefully grown from them. So that sounds like a good takeaway from that. Okay. So continuing. So those were the first two ideas. The third concept I want to touch on in terms of just being the best mother for our children is being grateful for our children, being in a grateful state instead of a frustrated space. When we're in a grateful space, we have joy in our home and positivity in our home instead of stress in our home. Being grateful, you have more than one child for each child individually. You know, there's a level of gratitude for your children and then for each child and especially for the challenging children. Thinking of that challenging child, now maybe all your children are equally challenging, so you don't have one that jumps out as the challenging child. Maybe today you have one and next week it might be a different one, but being grateful for that challenging child, for that individual child, thinking of his or her strength, he's a great kid, she's a great kid, putting everything else on the side, being grateful for this great kid that God gave you. It's the biggest gift. The biggest gift is a child. That's that's a gift of eternity being grateful for the gift. And if the child's really driving you crazy, thinking how much you really, really love this child, how really much you you, you do, how much you love him, how much you love her. Look back at baby pictures. Remember, raising a difficult child means every child's a plant, but some children are trees. It's a thought from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Every child, we have to nurture, you know, water, add fertilizer, pull out the weeds. We have to do that for every child. But some children take an enormous amount of work, the Rebbe says, because they're not trees, they're plants. I'm sorry, they're not plants, they're trees. So when we're looking at a child and and all the weaknesses of the child are driving you crazy, generally, 
obviously this is a general principle which means it doesn't always work. In your case, it might not work. But generally, the very big weaknesses are also the very big strength. Generally. And if you can envision this child when they're 20 or in 20 years, if they're already 15, you know, and then just, just envision those weaknesses turned around. What are they going to look like as strengths? Envision them now. Try to get them now to be strength if they're stubborn or strong willed or very firm in their opinions. How can those be strengths and how do you get them to be strengths now? And how do you see them, hopefully, as they're going to be those strengths? And when they're 20 or in 20 years. And I think for myself, it's easier because I have children in my in their 30s and I have my youngest is nine. So I know the oldest ones came out okay. <laughs> so I can be more trusting with my younger children. I can say, okay, you know, they also gave me a run for my money. They also, you know, came out okay. So just in general, feeling blessed, feeling grateful understanding, knowing, feeling, I'm so blessed that I have these children in my life. And so blessed I have children. I'm so blessed with each one, each specific one with all of the ways they can pull at me. Feeling so, so blessed, so, so grateful just shifts the energy. So instead of you dealing with them from this point of frustration, annoyance, you know, frazzled, you're looking at them as like, oh yeah, this you're the, you're the blessings in my life. That's a very, very different way of looking at someone. And they feel it. And they know it. You feel it. You know if someone's looking at you frazzled and frustrated or as if you're the blessing in the life. So they do too. Another important point, I think, to keep in mind is watch out for the courtrooms in our mind. We have courtrooms and courtrooms are always judging. And in this perspective, you know, and in our mothering role. The courtrooms are judging us as a failure as a mother and also judging our child. But we have to shut those courtrooms. Now, by the way, if this topic of mothering isn't the one on your head, primarily, it's there or not there. But this idea of courtrooms in the mind is true for all of us in all situations. So in general, we all have courtrooms in our mind. We are all constantly judging and it's a really bad thing to do. So it's good for us to be aware of that and to close them. Not in session, not in session, not in session. I don't want to be the judge. I'm not the heavenly court. God is. The angel, the angelic courts are there to judge, not me. And as we've discussed, and I know we've said this over the years many times, how very often the heavenly court will set up a situation for us to see someone doing something similar to what we've done wrong so we can judge them and that's how we are judging ourselves. So we always want to judge favorably and we always want to keep the negative courtrooms of our mind closed and that has nothing to do with us being mothers and parents. It just has to do with us being good human beings. Um, but especially in this arena, there's very often courtrooms in session and they're doing two things simultaneously. They're judging our child and they're judging us as a parent. And generally, we give our child a bad verdict and we give ourselves a bad verdict. We often think we're a failure as a parent. Anyone here think they're a failure as a parent sometimes? You can raise your virtual hand. All the time. Never first call <laughs> yourself a failure as a parent. Unfortunately, all the time. Yes, we all are so, so harsh on ourselves. Are we that bad? <laughs> are we truly such? I mean, we're not dysfunctional. We care. You know, why do we all, of course, no question, very often think of ourselves as failures and parents because of those courtrooms in our mind. Those are not happy places. Those are not healthy places. And we also, in those same courtrooms, can be very, very harsh in how we judge our child. And when we feel that harsh judgment, they feel it. When we feel that negative energy, they feel it. Both for yourself and your child. For your child, your child messes up. Like, Christelle just said very beautifully, she's going to let her kid make mistakes. He's going to make mistakes in life. I, I think she's quite right. He will. We all do. That's part of how God created us to learn. Oh, your child messes up in something. Give him or her the same benefit of the doubt you give your neighbor. Hopefully you give your neighbor. You're supposed to give your neighbor. Well, you're supposed to give your child also. Don't create judgments against your child. And don't blame yourself for his failing. And you can say, but it's my fault. <laughs> 
<laughs> I blame myself because it's my fault. Maybe it's my fault because he's exactly me. All those weaknesses he has, hey, they're mine. How else did he turn out this way? But that's not always true. That's not always true. Sometimes your child has unique weaknesses that have nothing to do with you and nothing to do with how you raise them, not genetically and not environmentally. They're separate, independent people. My husband and I are both very strong learners. And it was just like a, a given. I didn't even think about it. It was an obvious in my head that obviously my children would all be strong learners. Well, guess what? We have a number who are not. Why? God decided. That's what God decided. Genetically, they all should have been. Environmentally, they all should have been. But guess what? It wasn't God's vision. It's true with everything. And like with every other person besides yourself, you can turn to God and complain. Why is he doing this to this innocent child? Why is this child suffering? Why does this child have this raw deal? You're allowed to do that. But again, if the child has a weakness that's not yours, it's not yours. Why are you thinking you gave it to them? If the child has a weakness that has nothing to do with the environment you created, you didn't. Do anything in the environment that you give him that weakness. And maybe he has a weakness that is yours. Okay, so you have to grow and he has to grow. And your growing is going to help him and his growing is going to help you. And maybe he does have a weakness from the environment. Okay, so again, you're a work in progress. He or she is a work in progress. But keep moving. Don't get stuck on blaming. Don't get stuck on the past. I saw this interesting idea yesterday. I just saw it yesterday. Connected with this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is Vayera. And there's many interesting things that happen in Vayera. And one of them is the destruction of Sodom and Amorah. And as I'm sure you all know, it says the only people saved were four people. Lot, Aram's nephew, his wife, and their two daughters. Their two single daughters. And everyone else was destroyed, including their married daughters. And it says that as Lot and his wife, Edith, Erith, and the two daughters were leaving, they were told, don't look back and see the destruction. And Lot's wife looked back and she got turned into a pillar of salt. And the Talmud even discusses how every day she's licked by the cows and then regenerates the next day. The tour guides point out who they think is that pillar of salt. That's Lot's wife. And it's explained, you know, in, in the Midrash, like, well, what's going on? Why a pillar of salt? Because really, she, when Lot brought these angels who they both thought were men home, and he was going to host them because he had learned that in the house of Abraham to host guests. And she was like, what are you bringing that horrible custom to this place? I'm like, yes, we don't do that anymore. And she was so like upset with him that she went from house to house saying, I borrow some salt. My husband, he brought these guests to our house. Ah. And that's how the whole city found out about the guests and everything else that happened, if you remember. What happened then, how the whole city really tried to violate and abuse these men. So she really deserved to be punished. And looking back, okay, this was biblically what she was told she wasn't allowed to do. And therefore she was punished. And therefore she didn't deserve to see the destruction because all four of them really deserved to be part of the destruction. They were only saved in Abraham's merit. So that's why she was punished. And she was punished in this fashion. Everything I just said, I assume you know. I'm just sort of reviewing the... The, the, the basic storyline there. So I saw an interesting concept yesterday in connection to this. A person was saying, she was talking about post the Holocaust and how some people she felt just kept looking back like Lot's wife and like getting stuck, like that pillar of salt, that bitterness, that stuckness. I kept looking back in the pain, at the pain, at the horrors, at the traumas, and they couldn't move forward. They became those pillars stuck of salt, just, you know, this bitter stuck space. And I thought that was a very interesting human application to this concept. And I think it's relevant in many situations, including ourselves as parents. And of course, it's also relevant to other situations, not as parents, but we can apply it to many situations in our life. And we've all made mistakes. I assume I've made mistakes. I assume most of us have made mistakes. If you haven't made mistakes, that's awesome. Most of us have made mistakes. And we've all had pain. I've had pain. I'm sure many of us have had pain in our life. We might have had pain with our children. We might have made mistakes with our children. We might have gone through very hard times with our children. Or it doesn't have to be anything to do with our children. We're just happy to now be talking about ourselves as parents, but you can apply this in many other areas of your life. And, and we just, just sort of remember this idea, which is sort of sort of graphically expressed by Lot's wife and the pillar of salt, that it's not always so healthy, doesn't usually help that much to keep looking back. It's very easy to get stuck. It's 
very easy to become that pillar of salt, very easy to be in the pain, stuck, not moving, which again, in this application as mothers, maybe you made mistakes with your kids. I'm sure I've made many mistakes with my kids. Maybe you did things wrong. Maybe you're too busy. Maybe you're too distracted. Maybe you're too overbearing. Maybe you're too involved. Maybe you were a helicopter mom. Maybe you were a not, not a missing an action mom. I mean, or anything else. But we don't gain that much by looking back and thinking of those things. You know, just a tiny bit, a tiny bit of salt, just enough to make the future different. But otherwise we don't, just so we can think of ourselves, children, and, and the parents we have. Did our parents make mistakes? Probably they made mistakes, just like probably we've made mistakes. But you know what? Also part of God's script. People make mistakes, but it's part of God's script. If you look at your child and you think you should have, and you didn't, you were, and you shouldn't have been, you shouldn't have been, and you were, and you could, again, think the same thing in terms of you and your parents. We're moving forward. We're moving forward. And I think the courtrooms of the mind, the, the fodder, the food, that keep those courtrooms very active, especially in terms of judging ourselves, is that looking back and being stuck, and thinking of what we did wrong. And again, it might have been very legitimate things we did wrong, but we're, we're not going to gain that much. Besides, you know, a little bit just to say, hmm, this child could use more mothering. I'm going to make a point. This child could use more independence. Okay. okay, move on. That's it, move on. This child could use more abilities to take risks. This kind of child could use more trust. This child could use more adventure. This child could use more opportunities to shine. Okay, I can look back just to see, like brief looks, just to keep moving forward. And maybe, you know, modifying the, the, the situations to not repeat those mistakes. But otherwise, don't judge. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. It says that when the Mashiach comes, God will thank every single person for what they did for bringing the redemption. Even though he knows we could have done more. So he knows we could have done more, but he's not focusing on that. He's appreciating our good, our, our help for, for bringing the redemption. That's how we're supposed to look at our children as God is looking at us. He's looking at us because we're his children. So he's modeling how you're supposed to look at your children as we want to be looked at by our loving father. That's how we should treat our children the way God is treating his children. Appreciate their good, thanking them for their good not judging them for their lacks. Very often we have unstated expectations and then the other person fails because they're unstated. And they're determined by me as, the, as the, the, the judgment, the judge of these unstated, creator of these unstated expectations. And then you're hurt and because they didn't live up to your unstated expectations. And then you express some ways or another, you're hurt on that. So we have to really reassess our expectations. We have to communicate our expectations. We should ideally receive agreement for our expectation to stop this very probably familiar to many of you cycle. And something else, you know, along these same lines, just another sort of thing that very common is we don't need to make bad horrific. We should do the opposite. We should shrink it. We should understand we all have different natures. We all have different challenges. My child is not me. I never had those desires. I have different ones. I never had those issues. I have different ones. My husband doesn't have them. I don't have them. Where did this kid come from? He's an independent person. He has strengths you don't have. He has weaknesses you don't have. Very, very, very possible. And every, every weakness, so to speak, every nature that we have, we always want to try to think, how can I use this for God? How can I use this for good? We want to think about ourselves and we want to think about our child. It's good to think about ourselves and to model it and to let them know what we're doing with ourselves. You know, mommy's very strong-willed and she's either doing things to not be so strong-willed or she's using her strong will to do all this good. You know, mommy pushes herself very hard. She's trying to not push herself so hard or she's trying to push herself hard in good things. So we talk about it because your children are going to need to do the same thing, maybe in their own areas, but they're going to have to do the same thing. It says in the Talmud, a murderer, a doctor, a ritual slaughterer, a circumciser, they all have the same nature. They all have the nature of shedding blood, but you can use it for bad. You can use it for neutral. You can use it for godly. But we always want to share that thought with our children for, in our own self, share with them, model our work, our growth. 
this is mommy's nature and this is how she's trying to use it for good or this is how she's trying to change her nature. And it's very good for children to know you can change your nature. It's very good for children to know you can use the nature for good. And definitely don't get stuck in a clash of wills with your child. You just both end up being losers. I have a lot of very strong will children. <laughs> so I know that is never, never, never going to be a victory if we try, if we get stuck in wills. Disengage. If the child's stuck, you don't want to be stuck as well. If the child's losing it, you don't want to lose it. Um, there's rules in every house. Some rules to houses have a lot of rules. Some houses have less rules. Hopefully rules have consequences. Because if rules don't have consequences, they're not often very effective. But don't worship the rules. Don't worship the consequences. The goal of rules, the goal of consequences is to help the child. So I'm going to touch on what Natalie just said, but I'm just going to finish this idea. Just because sometimes people get very stuck on worshiping their rules and feeling they're supposed to, feeling that's, that's a good parent. Again, parents should have rules for homes to run properly. There should be rules for homes to run properly. There should be consequences, definitely. But you always want to remember the goal is to help the child. Make sure the rule's appropriate. Make sure the consequence is appropriate. Make sure you are appropriate. Because if you're all worked up, it doesn't make a difference however beautiful that rule and consequence is. It, it's going to become a wicked tool in your hands. If you're worked up, go to the washroom. Take a walk. Calm down. Go to your bedroom and lock the door before you enforce the rule. Because it could be the rule and consequence are great, but not for this child. Maybe this child needs a different rule and consequence. It's fine to modify the rules and consequence for each child. And sometimes we just have to remember this child is my test. You could look at, have, like just envision the word test written across that child's forehead. And God keeps testing you until you pass. Or you could think this child is my gift. And just envision the word gift written across that child's forehead. And when you look at them, just see that word gift shining. Or see that word test shining. And they can both be true. And you could you could look sometimes like this and sometimes like this. But that's that's true for all of our children. There are gifts. Sometimes we don't appreciate them enough. And sometimes there are tests. So Natalie said there's a lot of battle of wills in her house. She 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 related to that term. Um, what do you do about it, Natalie? Sorry, my hands were full there for a second. Um, well, what I used to do was like what I remember seeing on the nanny TV show. Remember the British nanny? She'd come in and she'd fix the misbehaving children. And it's like you have the time because my oldest is five. I'm very short. My husband is tall. I know that physically he's going to be stronger and bigger than me very soon. Five-year-olds in jujitsu. So just like getting in and all my kids are very active. Do like timeouts on the stair, right? Because when they were little, little, they didn't get this. It wasn't a punishment. It never worked. And in our apartment, we didn't really have a good spot for it. And it turned into this like wrestling match where he wouldn't stay on the stair. And it's like, okay. and I'm like physically trying to hold him on the stair to do the timeout. And that didn't work. And so then it was like, okay, well, if you can't behave yourself in here in this room with the family, you need to go, you know, you maybe step outside or something. And it would turn into these like screaming matches and like I'd put him in his room and he'd bang on the door. I imagine and it the TV just, show never looked like that. Well, I, it was awful. And it's like, well, this isn't working. And so, I mean, or it just the other day at the park, this was just yesterday. He has this humongous one liter insulated water bottle and he accidentally hurt his friend with it because it's really big and heavy. And I said, okay, we need to put it in the car. I know it was an accident, but let's put it in the car. And he wouldn't climb down to give it to me. And I said, either you're going to put it in the car or we're going to leave. And he wouldn't do it. He's having a meltdown. And I said, okay, fine. We're just going to leave because it's, it's like you said, as soon as you get that battle of wills, he could be there all day. So I loaded them all up and we left. And it was this whole big meltdown in the car the whole way home. Are all the others following in his lead? Oh gosh, the three-year-old. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing is the oldest, the five-year-old, he, like yesterday he had, he was my angel all the way up until that point and then it was just like nope I was gonna say but the three-year-old <laughs> you're right you to be that but the three-year-old is like you know you tell him not to do something don't shoot pencils with your crossbow That's pretty like, basic rule it's right. for marshmallows don't shoot pencils with the crossbow two seconds later he's doing it again obviously don't pour yourself a soup bowl of cereal that's bigger than your head and then not eat it 
and he does it every day this week until yesterday I made him sit at the table all day until he ate the whole bowl because I was just I was I was done with it definitely Crystal said so been there and I think we've all been there so the good news is they grow up um the good news is you're not going to be battling with them on their Cheerios when they're 15 you shouldn't be and they shouldn't be or their marshmallows or you know whacking a kid with their water bottle and the the not as good news is very strong-willed children can, can grow up to be very difficult to deal with strong-willed adults so oh I'm sure yeah will, my my best friend is like gee I wonder where they got that <laughs> so you will you will not have these struggles but you will learn how to dance around and try to help them control themselves. I mean, definitely the, the strongest thing I've learned with my children that are very strong-willed is never engage with them. That's what I've learned. I have also, thank God, many very strong-willed children. And I say thank God seriously, because that's good. You know, hopefully they'll be very successful adults that will use their strong will to serve God and do good in this world. But strong wills don't scare me. It's not saying a, a mean person, a self-centered person, which of course very normal, also a petty person. Strong will person is, is can do much good because of their strong will. And I think most people that do a lot in this world are strong willed. I have a very strong willed child. Actually, I have many, but this was one of my older ones. I remember telling him very often, I said, you're just like my father. Passed away many years ago before the child was born. I said, my father was very strong willed. I said, and he used his strong will always for good. It's not a problem being strong willed. I mean that. I don't think there's anything wrong with being strong willed. You just want to use it for good. So it's not a problem that he's strong willed. Look at it and say, what a gift. What a gift. How do we use this for good? How do we take your strong will and make good choices with it and really make things happen because you're strong will? But in terms of, I'm saying, me handling them when they were younger, you know, and not only when they're three and five, also when they're eight and 10 and 12 and 14, uh, definitely, I mean, anybody else can chime in what they've learned. But to me, the strongest thing that I believe is needed for strong willed is just disengage and don't let it get to you. In Obviously, we all have different levels of tolerance. I have a pretty high tolerance of not letting things get to me, of just tuning out, which could mean the child could jump up and down and shriek and shout. And, and I just like, I just don't, I just ignore it. I, I, I'm, I get very good at just totally like spacing out on it, like just not focusing on it. Because I mean, even on a very, like you're saying, you said don't, and he did. How surprising. So did this today, my son, Joe Bear, who by day doesn't wear a diaper, but be, before he goes to sleep, I put him in a diaper. And um, so he put his hand, you know, under his diaper. And I said, no, we don't do that. And not modest and not clean, not hygienic, whatever. And then right away, put it in again. And, and he looked at me and I just ignored it. I'm like, I know if I said to him something, he's just going to do it again because he's getting what he wants. Now, again, you could feel free to say that was a wrong mothering thing. I, I'm not saying it was necessarily the right approach, but I definitely knew he was doing it, looking at me and waiting for a reaction. So I didn't give him one. So don't do that is, is an invitation to do it and see what's going to happen if I do it. Mm. So you have to like think, what else can I do besides say, don't do, because you really don't want to give them an invitation to do. If this, if it's, if the cereal bowls are, are way too big for them, can we remove those cereal bowls and only have small cereal bowls? If the crossbow for the marshmallow, whatever that means, is too tempting, can we remove them? I, I always try, and again, I, I definitely would like to hear other people's uh, tips on on these situations. But I always try to think, what can I change in the environment? Because it's a lot easier to change the environment than change the kid. So, <laughs> if the cereal bowls are too big let me get them hidden away for the next few years. You know, if these marshmallows are too tempting, let me put them in a place where they don't know they exist, can't reach, can't get to them. It's much easier to me to modify the marshmallows or the, or the cereal bowls than to modify my children. So I would say in general, in general, you want to always, always look. I know my son, my special needs son, he had 
bookshelves in his room just because we have so many books, thank God, in our house, so many holy books. We just don't have room for them. So we have bookshelves every space possible, including in my son's bedroom. And then he would take down the books and then he'd rip them and he'd throw them on the floor and morning after morning I'd come in and it would break my heart and these holy books were on the floor and they're ripped and they're papers. And I'd get all upset and, you know, of course, upset at my husband because my husband was one that put the books in. And finally, one day, packed up the books, got them out of his room, moved the bookshelves. Like, guess what? Yeah. I mean, there might have been another solution to train him not to touch them, but I couldn't do it. It wasn't happening. But once we got the books out of his room, that removed the whole problem. When you're when you're looking at these children that are so strong-willed, you definitely don't want to engage. You definitely don't want to get stuck wherever they're stuck. You definitely want to try to make it lighter. I had this recently with the same child. I don't remember. It was like maybe a day or two ago where he was, okay, so he was trying to go to the bathroom, I think. I don't exactly remember. But I was just started like singing some ridiculous song that I was making up as I was going along and singing this song. I remember he thinks it was upstairs. Trying to, I don't even remember all the details, but singing this crazy, silly song and singing, singing the song and singing the song. I think it was getting to the bathroom. Might have been something else. I remember my husband was like laughing and saying, oh, look, you got mommy to sing. <laughs> it's not like my walked around the house singing, but it was just like something to like change it, not to get stuck, not to get, he's, he's stuck and I'm stuck and he's stuck and I'm stuck. I'm not stuck. I'm singing. You know, I'm singing some crazy, silly song. So I'm not stuck. And then like, he didn't get stuck. And then like, we got to the bathroom where we we're trying to go. I don't want to pretend everything is success. Obviously it's not. I just am not sharing right now my failures. I'm trying to bring out some of the things that work to share with you. And I'm sure there's plenty of things I do that don't work. Any other tips from the field of people knowing how they deal with those very strong-willed children? Thank God. Girl, I'm always working on changing my behavior <laughs> and hoping that if I just change my behavior and change how I'm, I'm, you know, managing it or, or dealing with it. And like you mentioned, like with frustration and just like all of that, if I work on myself, I find that, you know, his, his stuff automatically almost goes away sometimes it does because it's such a dance and it's very hard for us sometimes to see that because clearly the child is the problem not you <laughs> but it's such a dance and 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 it's our is it deliberately trying to trigger us yeah sometimes it is or sometimes they don't they can't consciously articulate that but it is and definitely when we disengage from the dance when we stop dancing or we do a whole new dance it it definitely uh makes things fun and definitely i always find things that are funny things that are humorous things that are silly things that are weird are are very very good to to stop the dance i i um i might have shared in the past this one of these again sharing my success stories not my failure stories this was my child who's now uh, almost 15 and so very strong willed, <laughs> very strong willed. I don't know how old he was then. Maybe, I don't know. I don't remember what year it was. Maybe he was 10. Maybe he was eight. Maybe he was 12. I don't think he was 12. Maybe he could have been 10 or nine, right? And um, it was, it was the final day of the circus holiday, I guess. And we're in synagogue all day and all the kids are doing all day is eating sugar and refined flour. So like, overload of sugar, overload of flour, overload of exhaustion, no normal sleeping for like the past week and just in synagogue all day. And now we're walking home and my child who is one of my strongest will child and I have all my kids are strong will, but this one like, ooh, over, over exceeds everyone. And again, I don't know if he was six, if he was eight, if he was 10 and he just like, he was done. That's it. He wasn't walking. And he just like stopped and he was not going to move one drop. And my husband is trying to push him, trying to, I don't know, physically push him, but force him, coerce him, cajole him, nothing. And my husband was just getting like, I could just see it. And I like, I think I was like a little bit behind walking with some of the other kids. I got to him and I said to my husband, it's okay. You go ahead with the other kids. I'm going to deal with it. Not that I knew what I was going to do, but I just definitely thought my husband was doing wasn't working. And I was like looking at this kid who was so stuck and he's so stubborn. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And I did the only thing I could think of, which I was being really like silly and weird and just was just came to my head that don't ask me what. And I started pretending I was like a, a soldier in like, you know, Buckingham Palace, you know, no, not bending your knees. And I started walking like that. And I don't ask me why. I just started saying 
the names of the holidays, like a chant, Shmini, Atzeres, Simchas, Tyre, Shmini, Atzeres. And I just like ignored him. I was just walking and I'm so cool. I'm having such a good time walking very slowly. Shmini, Atzeres, Simchas, Tyre, like, like, totally ridiculous. And it like, it looks so intriguing that of course my son joined me. And the two of us are walking, you know, not, don't bend your knees, don't smile. We're guards in the palace. Shmini, Atzeres, Simchas, Tyre. And we passed my husband, just like, listen to my husband, don't say anything, don't say anything, ignore us. And we keep walking, Shmini, Atzeres, Simchas, Tyre. We walk that way the entire way home. Uh, it was definitely a success story. It was definitely a, 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 a something from God, because I don't think I would have thought of it on my own. And it definitely worked. That's a, it was a very extreme story. It was like an extreme situation. But it sounds like yesterday was also an extreme situation. And like, I, I really find that's the best, at least for me, at least for my children. Just don't go there. Don't engage. Just get totally left field, totally silly, foolish, just totally different. And I mean, I also find it with other children in different situations. Like, you know, if a child is just, I don't know, getting stuck in something. I could see this impending meltdown. I just like start talking about something else, talking about something interesting, talking about something silly, joking, this, that, just to like derail them for that like impending meltdown that I see is about to happen. Like before it happens, try to like divert them from it. So I think in general, it works for me. Anyone else? Any, anyone else, anything that works for them in these areas? And I definitely agree with what Crystal said. Look at yourself because, yes, a lot of it reflects back on us. Well, I have a question, Cyril. Like, in those moments, like, what is God trying to teach us? You know, like, in those moments that have been successful to you where you were able to step outside of yourself and be silly and go completely different, you know, just so that you don't get stuck and you can try to get your child unstuck. Do you think that, I mean, is, is there a lesson there for, for us in that moment? Absolutely. He's, what have I learned from raising my children? A lot of humility. A lot of humility, a lot of vulnerability, a lot of, I don't know how, I'm not the expert, I'm clueless, I can't control this child. It's a very, very, very humbling feeling. I don't think anything humbles up as much as our children. I mean, if your children don't humble you, that's great. But mine have definitely humbled me over the years many, 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 many times. Thank God I have many children. My oldest is, I have, you know, 32, almost 33. My youngest is nine. Thank God I have many children. And I don't find that I'm getting better. I think the kids are getting harder. <laughs> so don't want to scare anyone. But um, I can be very humbled. And I can be like, this is crazy. I've been raising children for so many years. How do I not know how to handle this child? You know, why is it such a stretch? It's so difficult. I I, I, I find it definitely. I, I, I'm sure there are specific lessons, which there are in specific situations, but the overarching thing I feel that our children do is humble us. They make us real how, realize how dependent on God we are, how limited we are, how not skilled we are, how vulnerable we are. And, and I think that's a really big, huge lesson in life. And I think our children give that to us. I think also our children give us a very strong lesson in being other-centered, which I believe is a stepping stool to being God-centered. Meaning I think that our, our, I think our nature, like the nature of the beast of man, is to be very, very, very self-centered. I think we're all very self-centered. And I think our society, of course, just reinforces being self-centered. It's a very egocentric, I society and all this social distancing has made us more egocentric and all these gadgets have made us more egocentric. I mean, it's just our world. And I think marriage helps because I think marriage, you need to be other centered for a marriage to work, but you can be other centered to a certain degree and you can still be quite self-centered, but I don't think you can be really self-centered and be a, a mother. I think, again, the process of being a mother is very humbling, really <laughs> makes us see how limited we are. And really makes us focus on the child. Like I'm saying, to disengage from that dance, you have to really focus on that child and on those child's needs. Because I want, like, why can't I just, like, hold this kid and put them in their seat or take away that water bottle or put it in the car or, you know, such simple things. So th that's when we have this force of wills. Like, I'm going to get you to do it. No, you're not. 
well, I'm still bigger than you. Yeah, but soon, like Natalie's saying, she won't be. So that's not a good road to go because it's not going to work for too long. And if you're training your child in that road, you're going to lose very big time, very fast. So it's really like being very other centered and really like, wait, like, like, like I'm saying, like in my story, like this kid is like way too sugared up, way too exhausted, way too stuck. This kid just needs me to get him out of his situation. Like that's being like totally other centered. No, it is not normal for me to walk down the streets of my neighborhood. Like, 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 like that. But that wasn't about me. It was about what does this child need right now and getting him home. So I, I think that's a big process. And I think that has to do with our relationship with God, because I think ultimately we want to be God-centered people. And I think this movement of being other-centered, of being spouse-centered, of being child-centered really helps us become more and more selfless, which really means becoming ultimately God-centered. So I think those are the two big pieces I see in general in all of these situations. And then, of course, case-specific, like maybe you shouldn't take yourself so seriously so you can make a fool of yourself. And like, why not? Like that might be a very case-specific, you know, benefit. Or maybe you have to slow down. Like I know for myself with, with my nine-year-old, so my daughter, who went back to Israel, she's wonderful with him, amazing with him. And she was home for a few weeks. You know, she's, she's living in Israel, but whatever, she's home for a few weeks. And, and I was watching her, you know, a little bit with him and she's so good. And I'm like, what's the difference between her and me? She just has so much more patience. She just is like all the time in the world. Now I could argue and say, well, she does have all the time in the world. She has nothing else she has to do. She has nothing she has to do. So she could just like spend all this time with him. And maybe if, you know, she had a life, if she was a mother, if she was working, I mean, she wouldn't either be that patient. But I think it's also a personality thing. I think by definition, I'm just move, come on, let's get this over with. And, um, and I, and I, so I'm like trying just, just pretend I have all the time in the world. I don't have all the time in the world, but I have a little more time than I'm allowed. Give him that space. Things are going to take longer. He's going to want to talk about this and talk about that and get stuff. I want to like do this and he's going to want to do this. And that's just, just to a certain degree, let it happen. So that's big work for me besides being vulnerable and being humble and being other centered. It's a very specific work for me in terms of patience. So I think we have all three going on, the broad strokes and then the specific things that we need to work on. Anyone else have any other tips in terms of this avoiding the battle of the wills? I don't know. I mean, this doesn't always work for me and I had to step away for a few minutes. So I don't know if somebody mentioned it, but um, you know, you had mentioned not saying what not to do or not saying what you don't want them to do. Like Dovey putting his hand in his diaper. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I've tried to do is not say, you know, don't do that or don't do that unless it's an emergency or something, but instead of, you know, Hey, let's do this. Like in the bowl example tomorrow, why don't you let mommy know? And I'll help you pick out the bowl or, you know, the blue bowl or the yellow bowl are really good bowls for cereal you know, which one do you want to try tomorrow kind of thing. Um, that takes patience. <laughs> like I understand, you know, that doesn't always make sense in every scenario, but trying that has been helpful for me in some scenarios. Always, because every time you tell a child don't, it's an immediate trigger for them to want to do it. Yeah. Like yeah. what's going to happen if I do? This is so cool. Mommy said, <laughs> no, let's see. Let's explore. <laughs> let's be scientists here. Adventurers. <laughs> Exactly. It just means they're normal. It just means they're normal. So yeah. I, I agree with Danielle. Any any sentence I can switch to a do instead of a don't. And I, when I'm focused and when I remember. Exactly. I do try because I, I it definitely helps. And again, just remember that general rule of like modifying your environment. Change the cereal bowls. Change the water bottle. So it's not something that's going to whack someone. You know what I'm saying? Just what can I do to change the environment? Because it's a lot easier to change the environment than to change the child. You can say, well, they're not learning. A lot of this stuff is because of their age, because of what's going on. They will on their own eventually learn these things, but you're dealing with them now. So now if we can make the environment easier and remove those things, it definitely 
definitely, um, definitely going to help. Um, moving a little quickly, but I just want to share some other things. I definitely think with my children, the best tool I use across the board with all of my children is giving them a lot of love, a lot of respect, trying to listen to them. Obviously, the older they are, the more I do that and the more it's appropriate to do that, the more it's easy and natural to do that. But I try it with all and you should do it with all of them, including including very young ones. Feel the love, express the love, show the respect, actively focus listening when they're talking to you. Um, again, there's many details on how to do that and, you know, like modify it for what works for you. But the basic point is I want to give them the message that they're important to me. And I really, that's to me a very, very important message to give my child. And I, and I see, because as I'm saying, I have older children. I definitely see that when you have that relationship, then it continues as they're older, you're still their mother and you're still important to them. And they no, they're important to you. And unfortunately, when you don't have that relationship, a lot of times when the children are older, they don't really have a relationship with their parents because they never really felt that or didn't feel it enough. It doesn't mean the parents didn't have all that love for them, but it's not enough to have the love. It has to be expressed. The love has to be expressed. The respect has to be expressed and the active listening, you know? And again, so I, I feel I'm, as I said, far from perfect. <laughs> Far, far, far from perfect. But this is one thing I, I do pretty well. And I think it makes a very big difference because the other things, okay, I make mistakes. I'm human. And I mean, you know, as they grow up, they're going to understand parents are human and parents make mistakes. But when they really know they were, they really felt the love and they really felt that you really cared and you really loved and you were really listening, you're really there for them. That's going to carry over a lot of the other mistakes you made because you were human. And again, I think as they grow up, they they can have compassion for that you were human. And we did make mistakes, you know? I have some of my children that think I didn't make any mistakes in raising them. I have some children that think I made many mistakes. But even the one that thinks I made many mistakes, it's it's okay. It's okay. So, you know, that's that's what we're aiming for, that we can make mistakes, but overall, it's good. I mean, this story I've shared before, but I think it's worth repeating, and I, I might end at that point, is um, this is with Lubavitcher Rebbe before he was Rebbe. People would come then to the central synagogue of Lubavitch, of Chabad, it was called, and it's still called 770. And people came that were not religious at all. And the Rebbe was from like in the 1940s. And the Rebbe was very nice to them, very warm, very friendly. And other people, Another person criticized the Rebbe, who was not yet Rebbe. Like, why are you being so nice to these people? Like, you know, you should give them the cold shoulder and they'll realize they're wrong, they're not religious, and they should shave up. You're being so nice, they're going to think they're fine. And the Rebbe, again, who was not yet Rebbe, he was like, thinking, you know, maybe this person's right, maybe I'm wrong. So he asked his father-in-law, who was the Rebbe, this dilemma question. And his father-in-law said, no. Well, I said, every parent loves a child. But if a child's not well, we love them more. And if a child is not well spiritually, that's the most severe not well, and we love them even more. So in other words, when you're sharing with these people that are not well spiritually, and you're being so kind and loving and giving them your affection and attention, that's that's exactly what a parent's supposed to do with a child like that. So I, the reason why I'm sharing this story is because to me, it means that we show sp special love and attention to a child who's not well. And the more a child is challenging, not always, but very often, the more they're hurting inside, which means the more they need your love, the more they need attention. In general, every child needs attention. Every child flourishes from love. Every child flourishes from attention. And very often, the more difficult a child it is, the harder it is to do that with them. Like the more unappealing it is to shower them with your love, attention, and the more important it is. And the more they need it, they need more love, they need more attention. And yeah, it's sometimes very hard to give it. And sometimes you don't feel they deserve it. And sometimes you don't feel warm and fuzzy, but it's really important to give them that love every day, many times a day, like a few seeds every day. And we give and we give and we give and we give. And it's, it's a long-term investment. In the end, you're going to see the strong roots in their belief in themselves, in their belief in you, and 
Every time you're showing love, it's another deposit. It's another deposit. It's another deposit. Don't worry. There'll definitely be plenty of withdrawals. <laughs> There'll be plenty of times you lose it. There'll be plenty of mistakes, but we just deposit, 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 deposit. And definitely I can see with my own children, you know, sometimes which are those children that just need it more and act out more because of it. And again, often they're not necessarily a space where they're so lovable, but those are the ones you got to give the most to. And, and very often when I'm focused, <laughs> I'll do things deliberately, which is just to make them feel loved and nurtured. Like whatever, they're complaining, they don't feel good. I know they're fine, but I'm going to be like, oh, let me massage your head. Let me make you a tea. Let me this, let me that. I don't think they need it. I don't think anybody's going to help. But what I know they need is to feel very loved. And I know that's going to help. So these things I'm saying are just means to give them what they do need. And I have to frame that in my head that way. This is another way for them to know how loved they are. This is another way for them to feel so nurtured and that's what they need. And that's what's going to help. And that's, uh, I think, overall, again, sometimes you give and give and give and give and give, but the child still feels so starved and ignored and deprived. Some kids have very vast, empty buckets. But try not to get frustrated. Envision that huge, empty bucket. Realize she's starving, but you're giving so much. Just think, sometimes I think it's good to like think, let's say if someone had a sensory issue, and they were going crazy with the noise level in the house. Well, you would understand they have a sensory issue. And even though everyone else can tolerate the noise, you totally understand that this child can because of the sensory issue. Same thing here. Well, they, they have a, a love bucket issue. And anybody else would feel so loved. But guess what? They have a love bucket issue. So they don't. So when you like sort of frame it that way, it's, it's easier. It's easier to... It's easier to um, to do, to to give and to give lovingly and to give again lovingly and to give again lovingly and to give again lovingly. I think it's also, sorry, I know it's, it's a little over time. I just want to sort of finish off these last details. It's good to like think of the different love languages, what this child needs to feel love, touch, gifts, time, words. When you think of your child, think what that child needs and give it to them. And of course, Probably different children are going to have different needs. Um, it's just the more we can do these things, it's like investment to avoid the other things. Like the more you can invest that love, invest that love, invest that love, that will remove and lessen dealing with all those meltdowns and battles of wills and not getting stuck and disengaging. So even it's like, who has the time for this? But like, well, that takes a lot of time. So if you instead try to invest some time, preempt the situation by investing the time this way, it could lessen the other situations. Any other questions, thoughts, or comments before we end? Okay. So like always in this, I threw out a lot of things. If you take one thing and do something different because of it, it was worth the hour. If you take three things and do three things different because of it, it was an even more valuable hour. But just make sure at least you put something in your pocket so you didn't waste the time. I learned a lot. That's for thank sure. Thank you. Really. Thank you so much. Me too. Thank you so much. Always good to remember. Bit. Always good to refocus. Yeah. Children yep. only benefit. Doesn't mean you ever say everything you said I knew. Beautiful. So which of those things you have to remember that you knew? Which of the things did I have to remember that I knew? <laughs> have a wonderful week. I mean, Child-centered, mother-centered, God-centered week. And hopefully you will more quickly than you can imagine see the difference. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.